We're going to go ahead and open the meeting officially. Um, good morning and welcome, everyone. This uh, is the meeting of the Physician Focused Payment Model Technical Advisory Committee, better known as PTAC. Welcome to the members of public, uh, the public who is here in attendance today. We also have a live stream um, and some folks on the phone. So thank you all for your interest in this meeting. Um, PTAC can play an important role in bringing the voice of the stakeholder community to Washington as the department moves forward on its value-based transformation agenda. To transform the healthcare system, physicians and other care providers need to be partners in moving forward. We appreciate the stakeholder input provided to the PTAC to date and look forward to continued feedback as we continue our work. We expend, extend a special thank you to stakeholders who have submitted proposed uh, models, especially those who are partic participating in today's meeting. Stakeholders who submit proposals to PTAC bring us voices from the field regarding new models for care delivery and payment. This is PTAC's seventh public meeting that in includes deliberations and voting on proposed Medicare physician-focused payment models submitted by members of the public. At our last public meeting in December, we just deliberated and voted on a proposal called Making Accountable Sustainable Oncology Networks, or MASON, submitted by the Innovation Oncology Business Solutions. Last month, we sent a report containing our comments and recommendations on the MASON proposal to the Secretary. Since our last meeting, we have also updated our proposal submission instructions. That document reflects some changes PTAC made based on public feedback we received last year. It also gives potential submitters a sense of what to expect after they submit a proposal. In addition, our preliminary review teams have been working hard to review five proposals, two of which are scheduled to deliberate uh, at today's meeting. Both of today's proposals relate to wound care. To remind the audience, the order of activities for each proposal is as follows. First, the PTAC members will make disclosures of any potential conflicts of interest. We will then announce any committee members not voting on a particular proposal. Second, discussions of each proposal will begin with a presentation from the preliminary review team, or PRT, charged with conducting a preliminary review of the proposal. After the PRT's presentation and initial questions from PTAC members, the committee looks forward to hearing comments from the proposal submitters and the public. The committee will then deliberate on the proposal. As the deliberation concludes, I will ask the committee whether they are ready to vote on the proposal. If the committee is ready to vote, each committee member will vote electronically on whether the proposal meets each of the Secretary's 10 criteria. After we vote on each criteria, we will vote on our overall recommendation to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And finally, I will ask the PTAC members to provide any specific guidance to ASPE staff on key comments they would like to include in the PTAC's report to the Secretary. As a reminder, as we begin discussions today on, uh, relative to the proposals under consideration, there's a few points needing to be made first. If any questions arise about PTAC, please reach out to staff through the PTAC at hhs.gov email. Again, that email address is ptac at hhs.gov. We've established this process in the interest of consistency in responding to submitters and members of the public and appreciate everyone's cooperation in using it. I would also like to underscore that the PRT report those reports are from three PTAC members to, to the full PTAC and do not represent the consensus or position of the PTAC. PTAC report, PRT reports are not binding. The full PTAC may reach different conclusions and from those contained in the PRT report, so they're gonna, they could be different and that's happened before. Finally, the PRT report is not a report to the Secretary of HHS. After this meeting, PTAC will write a new report that reflects PTAC's deliberations and discussions today, which will then be sent to the Secretary. PTAC's job is to provide the best possible comments and recommendations to the Secretary, and I expect 
that our discussion today will accomplish this goal. I would like to thank my PTAC colleagues, all of whom give countless hours to the careful and expert review of the proposals we receive. Thank you again for your work and thanks uh, for the public for participating in today's meeting in person via live stream and by phone. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, we have one PTAC member, Harold Miller, who is on the phone. Um, so <clears throat> I just want to make the folks aware of that. Um, the proposal that we're going to discuss first today is called Bundled Payment for All Inclusive Outpatient Wound Care Services in Non-Hospital-Based Settings. Uh, that was submitted by CIHA Medical and Wound Care. Um, I'd like to start the process by introducing ourselves and then at the same time read uh, disclosure statements on this proposal. I'll start with myself, Jeff Baylett. I'm the Executive Vice President of Blue Shield of California, and I have nothing to disclose. Uh, Angelo Sinopoli, uh, and I have nothing to disclose. Jennifer Weiler, nothing to disclose. Uh, Paul Casale, nothing to disclose. Bruce Steinwald, uh, I'm a health economist in Washington, D.C. I have nothing to disclose. Grace Terrell, nothing to disclose. Lynn Nichols, George Mason University, nothing to disclose. Kavita Patel, nothing to disclose. Tim Ferriss, Master General Hospital, no, nothing to disclose. Harold? Uh, hi, can everybody hear me? This is uh, Harold Miller, Center for Healthcare Quality and Payment Reform. Sorry that an illness uh, has prevented me from being there in person, uh, and I have nothing to disclose. Thank you, Harold. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Bruce, who was the lead on the PRT report. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm the lead on the PRT. The other members of the PRT are Angela Sinopoli and Grace Terrell. Um, in the course of my summarizing our, our, our PRT report, I encourage you to jump in at any time. Also, our principal staff person from ASPE is Audrey McDowell, who is also uh, at the table. Um, the submitter, uh, Dr. Faruqi, I believe is on the line. Is that true, Dr. Faruqi? Hello. That is correct. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, you uh, will have an opportunity after the PRT uh, uh, does its report to address the full PTAC committee and respond to its questions. And thank you for being uh, willing to participate. Um, okay, let's do the first slide. Okay, that's the uh, proposal. It's already been described to you. We, re we refer to it as the CIHA proposal. Next slide. Um, this is the, the process that we go through, um, um, and I won't uh, go into details because uh, I think we have done so enough. Next slide. Um, do we need to, well, we've done this a lot too, but there are always two or three members of the PRT, one of whom has to be a physician. Um, we uh, review the proposal, we, we give questions and get responses from the um, proposer. Um, we've asked our contractor to do some additional research on wound care, which I'll get into in a moment. And um, it's always worth emphasizing that the PRT report is a report of three individuals not the entire PRT, the, not the entire PTAC, and PTAC, as it has in the past, may come to a different conclusion than the, than the PRT has. Let's do the overview of the proposal. In other words, next slide. <laughs> um, Dr. Faruqi has submitted a fairly uh, straightforward proposal um, uh, to provide fixed price reimbursement per visit uh, for wound care provided in the office setting. Um, eligibility would be uh, for patients who have wound care needs to be treated. Um, the whole idea here is to encourage more uh, treatment of wounds that can be treated in the office setting to be provided in the office setting instead of in the hospital outpatient clinic. And by doing so, provide more convenience to patients, 
a lower cost, um, both to the healthcare system and also lower cost to patients who are, are required to pay co-payments. Uh, next slide. Uh, it's a, Dr. Faruqi proposes a $400 flat uh, payment per visit for all services provided um, with a couple of exceptions, one of which is hyperbaric oxygen treatments, a fairly sophisticated um, service that perhaps needs to be provided in the hospital outpatient department, and other services that are outside the, the realm of wound care, such as physical therapy and other services. Um, he proposes uh, there are certain wound care measures um, uh, that might be included as uh, in the proposal, although there's not a lot of specificity as to how they might be. Let's go to the next proposal. I'm oh, sorry, next slide. Um, we asked our contractor to do some preliminary research on the extent and cost of um, wound care services in Medicare. Uh, there's more detail on this in the PRT report. Um, uh, we did find um, there are, you know, a significant number of P Medicare beneficiaries who are diagnosed um, with uh, uh, wound care needs, uh, some of which are non-healing wounds. Um, but we were actually somewhat surprised to find that three-quarters of those services that are non-emergent are actually provided in the office-based setting. Um, it is certainly less expensive to the Medicare program for it to be provided in the office-based setting than in the hospital outpatient department. Um, we found that the majority of wound care services provided in the office setting were provided by podiatrists. Um, uh, and in the, in the hospital outpatient department, there's a lot of variety in who's actually providing the services. Next slide. Uh, this is a summary of our evaluation of the 10 criteria, uh, most of whom, most of which uh, we, we determined um, that the proposal did not meet the criteria. I'll explain why as we go through them individually. Next slide. Uh, scope, high priority. Um, our unanimous, unanimous conclusion was that this was met. Um, our general sense, and, and this would be a good place for our um, other members of the PRT who are physicians, and I am not, uh, to weigh in here, is that there is um, a genuine issue that Dr. Fuki has raised about um, how uh, the way that Medicare pays for wound care services discourages many physicians from providing services in their offices. Um, a major part of that is the difference in reimbursement. And part of what Dr. Faruqi is proposing is that let's, um, in essence, split the difference. Let's pay more in the office-based setting, encourage more doctors to provide uh, wound care services in their offices, uh, and it will still wind up being cheaper um, for both the Medicare program and for patients. Um, uh, to uh, encourage more provision in the office setting. And we thought the issue was a genuine one. We observed that there still are majority of services are provided in the office setting, but we decided that um, it was still significant enough um, in scope and there is no other um, proposal like this. There's no other model out there for wound care services, so we decided that it met the criterion. Next slide. Um, However, on the quality and cost, um, even though it, it certainly may be less costly on a per-visit basis, um, there's no constraint on the number of visits. It's, it's a visit bundle, not a, an episode bundle. Uh, we had some concern that there could be um, inflation in the number of visits um, if uh, there's a $400 payment per visit. And, um, and uh, a lack of insurance that there would be um, some cherry-picking of, um, of a number of doctors participating, uh, picking the patients who are less expensive to care for. Uh, Grace and Angelo, any additions? Remember, uh, please jump in. Next slide. Um, payment methodology. Um, certainly the, the simplicity of the model is um, appealing and, uh, and yet we had a, a problem of, um, uh, of justifying the specific amount of $400 per visit. And um, there's no risk adjustment or anything like that, no negative consequences for uh, doctors participating in the model if the uh, costs, um, uh, 
if, a, for example, a patient um, is referred on for care in the, in the hospital, um, the physicians participating in the model don't um, have any negative consequences of that. Next slide. Um, the, um, I, by the way, I've kept um, the slides very succinct. Uh, there's a lot more information, a lot more bullet points on the individual criteria. Um, but um, th the problem here is that uh, a per visit um, a payment system doesn't control the number of visits. Next slide. We decided it did meet the condition, the criterion of flexibility, because um, if indeed it does encourage um, more uh, office-based physicians to provide room care services, it gives more options for patients to um, seek care in either the hospital outpatient department or in the physician's office. Next slide. Um, although it it, it certainly could be evaluated. The proposal didn't articulate a methodology for conducting an evaluation. Um, and so uh, we thought that it was a bit too thin on this, um, on this criterion uh, to um, say that it meets the criteria, so our judgment was that it didn't. Next slide. There's no specific plan for integrating the wound care services with other services that the uh, patient may require. Um, and although uh, this uh, certainly could happen, and Dr. Faruqi may explain why he thinks it would, uh, there doesn't seem to be a guarantee or a, a part of the, the model that um, requires any care coordination for patients with, with wound. With wound, um, wounds that need to be treated but also may have other other conditions that need to be treated as well. Next slide. Patient choice, um, in large part for the reason I just stated, um, if there are more physicians providing wound care services in the office setting, it provides uh, patients with more choice. Um, this may be especially important in rural areas where um, hospital outpatient services are not as uh, readily available. Next slide. Uh, patient safety, we decided did not meet the criterion. Um, it's pretty much um, a, a fixed price per service without um, any, any uh, genuine assurance that the patients will be provided the services they need or that the patients um, who need to be in the hospital would in fact be um, uh, provided their services there if they participate in the model and needed to be transferred to the hospital. Next slide. Um, we decided it did not meet the health information technology criterion uh, because um, um, there's no real requirement um, of uh, the use of um, health information technology to, um, to accentuate the, the, the exchange of information and the other uh, information needs of the patients and the other providers of services um, uh, who are provided services in the hospital, in the, in the physician office. Uh, no uh, guaranteed exchange of information. So those are the 10 criteria. Um, just to generally um, uh, summarize the, I'm not gonna summarize the extent of the proposal, but what I am gonna say is, um, is if Bob Berenson were sitting at his chair over next to Kavita and Tim, uh, he might be at this point standing on his chair um, saying, isn't this a case where we should be, if there's a problem, the problem is with the fee schedule, not necessarily the, the lack of a model to play, pay for wound care services. I'm not asserting that, but I am saying that that's a topic that's worthy of discussion. And another issue is um, a more general one of Medicare payment, site of service um, neutrality, I mean, it's an issue that goes far beyond just wound care services. It, and, and if we'd like to think of this as a special case of a site of care problem, it's actually a much bigger problem than just wound care. And uh, we might want to discuss it at some point in that context of, um, of being a site of care issue, not just a wound care issue. All right, I am finished with my summary. Please, uh, Grace and Angelo. You did a great job summarizing, I think, uh, the PRT's 
uh, thinking on this as it's reflected in our report. Um, there are um, a couple of things that I think might be useful, and one is we're going to get a different type of uh, wound care proposal later this morning, and this is not deliberation about that, but there's certain themes that are being brought up that are slightly different, so it might be good to articulate uh, how this is different in a broader sense. So you're exactly right. This one is about um, site of service differential and how that potentially impacts the delivery of care. Um, and uh, the other one may be about that with respect to not the site of service, but the type of people who would uh, provide certain care services. So I think it's important as we're thinking about this one, as, uh, po possibly as we deliberate independently on the other one, to understand exactly what the, the problem is from the perspective of the proposer. Um, a larger point, though, is that when, when you start seeing the same thing over and over again as a theme to the PRT, that probably means that many people are being very thoughtful about something that is a real problem. Um, and we've seen that now in several respects. We've seen it with respect to, um, to uh, the provision of primary care, where we had several proposals and where I think there's some more coming. We have seen that with respect to um, uh, services uh, such as nursing home or hospital at home or other things that may be uh, further uh, provided uh, outside our traditional health care system. Um, we've certainly seen it in on oncology, uh, where we've had, from two points of view, two very thoughtful perspectives. And today we're seeing it with respect to wound care. So um, as we're deliberating, um, we have to be very specific about the merits of this, but I think that this is an opportunity for the committee and for um, uh, the secretary in general to say, why do certain themes keep coming up over and over again? It probably means there's something that many people see as a problem and we ought to pay attention to it. And, um, you know, the, um, with respect to this specific um, proposal, even though we got exceptionally good research done by our um, contractors, there was really, to my mind, a fairly limited amount of information we had to dig into it. Um, we were surprised to discover that, uh, you know, 75% of the actual provision of wound care was from, uh, was in the clinic setting, but we couldn't distinguish what was different about that which was provided in the outpatient hospital facilities versus that that was in the um, uh, office-based setting. Um, having uh, provided wound care as a primary care physician um, in both the nursing home setting as well as a office setting and having uh, led a multi-specialty group that one of the very first things we looked at when we started going down the ACO value route was where our wound care services were being provided. Um, it, it is likely that um, having better data um, over time will help us um, figure out in more detail how we can uh, better evaluate this, but some of these questions that are being identified in the, um, you know, by the stakeholders in the communities, uh, getting underneath the data to understand the scope of the problem and what they're seeing is a little bit difficult, um, even though we had uh, exceptionally good uh, research. So um, I'm hoping that that will be useful in our discussion, not only as we're dealing with the particulars of this, but as we're thinking in, in general about how we ought to approach themes that come over and over again. It usually means that there's a real problem. Thank you, Grace. Um, questions from PPAC members uh, for clarification? All right. All right. Um, I think it's time. Invite, to invite the submitters up to the table, and I, he's, I think he's uh, virtual, on the virtual, phone. Virtual he's going to be virtually, virtually <laughs> coming to the table. So, what he has, Doctor. So, Doctor Faruqi, you have how, how many minutes for? Uh, ten. Ten. Yeah. Ten minutes to, to address the committee, and then um, committee members may have questions for you after that. Thank you, Bruce. Doctor Faruqi, uh, welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, num uh, so, number one, I would like to thank the PTEC uh, committee members for considering and reviewing reviewing this uh, uh, proposal. 
And it's also the staff members, uh, people who send out the emails, who do the phone calls, who put everything together. Uh, my interaction has been um, very, uh, I say, pleasurable, uh, and looks like it's a very uh, well-run program. Okay, so um, I, you know, I have been providing wound care as I have uh, put it in the proposal for about 15 years, mostly to elderly people having a geriatric background. That was the reason for starting the wound clinic. Uh, because at that time there were not many people uh, providing this type of care uh, in this area. So over the years I have learned a few um, um, or rather many issues uh, that uh, uh, come um, trying to provide um, a good quality care um, in an independent setting aside from the hospital. So the proposal was in response to uh, those uh, shortcomings in the system and limitations and difficulties. Um, I do realize uh, some of the weaknesses that have been pointed out in the system. Um, on my um, um, one of the explanation is, you know, it's a limited uh, uh, resource. Uh, in terms of time and time and uh, otherwise. So this was a preliminary um, a proposal that I could put forward. Um, one of the um, uh, main reasons, and I think I have had some success, is trying to bring to light uh, the, the um, different policies that make it difficult to provide the care um, that is needed as well as uh, prevent uh, some of the recurrences. So that's why there was a, a multiple times emphasis in my proposal about the different uh, the LCDs or local coverage determinations, the global PDS, which make it um, harder um, to provide um, certain services or just basically eat up the cost if you do it. The others are preventive services, um, which may, again, not directly in the proposal, but I'm just going to quickly say two points. One is pressure ulcers. As you've done your research, um, and there are charts that show the cost of different uh, ulcers, it, pressure ulcers are very costly, and they can also lead to death, and I have seen it myself. Uh, the reason people have pressure ulcers is because they are not able to move. They are constantly in the same position, especially the elderly people. So if they are in a nursing home and in a hospital, there is somebody who can change the position. Um, but even at the nursing home or especially at home, it becomes difficult. So the way around this, you get the special mattresses. Uh, there are air mattresses. There are two types, one in which just the air is blown, the other is like an accurate where the pressure changes in different cells of the mattress is called low air loss mattress with alternating pressure. So if somebody has ulcer it's stage three or four, which is has gone to deep like muscle or bone level, the horse is already out of the barn and the cost increases. So the best thing would be to prevent it and put a mattress and other services to prevent to get to that stage. But medical policy does not allow uh, uh, an ear loss mattress unless there is a stage three or a stage four ulcer or multiple stage two ulcers. Doesn't make sense. Um, to some degree, maybe it's a stretch, will be the example of telling people will allow colonoscopy when it's a stage three and a stage four cancer. Um, so that's one. The second, in my experience, current practice, the example would be compression stockings. So to prevent the recurrences, uh, the, it's recommended for people should wear compression stockings. The medical guidelines do not allow compression stockings unless there is an ulcer present. But by the time the ulcer is present, it's late, and typically you need person needs compression bandaging and a whole lot of treatment. 
second. Medicare only allows 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury. I'm not sure if anyone there has tried that kind of compression stocking. I'm a pretty healthy person. It's not easy for me to put them on, let alone the 80-year-old people who, are, who have arthritis, poor dexterity. They cannot bend over. They, cannot, they don't have enough strength to pull that kind of tight stocking on their legs, which they don't need anyways. About 20 millimeters of mercury is sufficient to keep something under control um, and something that they can actually practically do. Um, so they, we end up sending them to pharmacies, buy something over the counter, which may or may not work. So some of the, the, the um, points in the proposal are related to those issues. Um, I will, um, um, and then um, there is definitely um, a question about per visit uh, justification versus uh, a bundled payment. So the per visit, you know, again, due to limited resources and going through the literature, trying to figure out uh, how much actually costs Medicare, um, and then act practically looking at a couple of bills that my patients were able to provide me when they were going to a hospital-based wound clinic. And those bills ranged anywhere from seven, uh, the, the, the payments, not the bills, the bills they can charge anything they want. The payments ranged anywhere from 700 to $1,400 per visit. So total cost uh, in the literature that at least I search, on an average, wound care was about 5000 anywhere from $5,000, $5,600 to $7,000. Uh, so that's how, and the average time to heal is anywhere from 10 to 16 weeks. The mean would be 12 to 13 weeks. So that's how uh, the, the proposal for $400 a visit was reached, that it would give at least 20% savings. At for the total healing of the wound. Now, the bundle, the problem with the bundled treatment, uh, sort of payment, is say, on the average, it costs $4,000 to heal a wound in terms of total, total number of visits, whether the person is going to the hospital or coming to an independent provider. A lot of times, at least in my practice, I see people coming again. They come with the right leg wound, or could be venous ulcer, could something, they, they fell, something fell on them. They heal, they go back three months later, two months later, something else happens. A lot of trauma wounds are easy to heal because, uh, you know, with the treatments, um, they could heal anywhere from um, four, five visits to 10 visits. Uh, the treatments are relatively simple. Um, each time they come in, it is a new episode. So that means each time the physician is getting a full payment of, it has to be uh, uh, an average payment that takes to heal the wound, which would be in thousands of dollars. Um, so the total cost in, at the end of the year may be more. So from that perspective, my feeling was a per visit cost will be more cost saving compared to a full bundle payment every time a person walks in. And there are not a lot, but a good number of people who have recurrences, either the same ulcer, um, which would probably be covered, but then they have you know, ulcers coming in different areas. They fall, they have arm skin rips off, their leg skin rips off. They walk into dishwashers or car doors and all that. Um, so then every time Medicare is paying a full amount which could be much larger than really uh, uh, needed. So uh, then there is question of uh, uh, limit on the number of visits. Um, so that, this is tricky, but my, if, if a bundle payment is being made and there is in the, if the Medicare is told that the average number should be, say, 12 or 14 visits, after visits it does or uh, it, it will um, somehow uh, trigger um, um, that you know, person is, is going there too much. 
in the current system, there is no limit. So my example would be somebody walks in with the venous ulcers and say uh, it takes 10 visits or 10 weeks to heal it. Under the proposal, is $4,000. If the same person goes to a hospital-based clinic and it takes 10 weeks or 10 visits to heal, it's not less than $4,000. It's at least 4500 onwards, but there is no upper limit there. In this system, there is a, an upper limit there. In that system, there is no upper limit there. Um, and if you go to Boone conferences, and from what I see there, the management companies are revenue-based. They need to maximize their revenue. That's why they're coming and managing for um, more or less free a wound clinic in a hospital. So there is definitely encouragement of utilization of more resources, which is what we are trying to limit here. Um, <clears throat> there was a question about uh, severity and complexity in the payment model. To be f uh, there, those indexes will probably have to be developed. There are not many indexes available. One of the um, uh, criticism about this is uh, cherry picking, uh, which has come up a few times. Um, it is, uh, my example would be concierge practice. A lot of people are already doing concierge practices. Um, so that is cherry picking. But the problem is, especially in smaller towns, especially in rural areas, uh, if the person walks in, uh, they cannot be turned away. Um, so cherry picking becomes less of a relevant issue in my own practice um, until the person is seen in the clinic. It's not possible. It's, it's difficult to know how extensive a wound is or how extensive a problem is. Sometimes the wound could be just a centimeter by centimeter, but it turns out to be a pyoderma or something much more complicated. So unless you see it, you cannot uh, deny a person uh, or turn them away just on the phone. Um, Dr. Faruqi? Yes. Are you wrapping up your comments? Yes, there? I am wrapping up. So, um, again, uh, this was an attempt to bring the issues on the ground. And, like you said, um, I see the issues and, and the weaknesses in the program, but I think it's at least in some way it's successful to bring uh, bring it to the CMS. To CMS. Um, I have, I think, in one of the uh, the, the summaries, uh, one of the lines says that this could be brought uh, to local CMS um, to resolve some of these uh, guidelines, LCDs, and global uh, payment issues. Um, I actually tried to reach out to our local contractor when I made a phone call uh, to who to write the letter. I was told the name of the medical director is not publicly disclosed. I could not have the name or the address uh, to address the letter and the issues, too. So um, that is not easy either. Um, so, But um, in the end, I would again um, thank the members for considering uh, this proposal, and hopefully something good will come out. Dr. Roki, thank you. Thank you uh, compliment you for your efforts and submitting this proposal and working with the PRT committee um, to get us to this point um, in bringing this issue forward. You're not alone, obviously, because as it was already mentioned, there's another wound care proposal in the queue that we're going to deliberate on after yours. Um, I would like to open it up to the committee members to ask Dr. Faroki any questions based on his comments and thoughts. Kavita? Um, so, Dr. Faroki, thanks for kind of going through kind of your logic. Can I ask a question building off of what Bruce and it sounds like the preliminary review team, uh, this is Kavita Patel since you're on the phone. I, it feels like there, 
it, it just explain to me because it feels like what really motivated you to put this proposal in was something that a lot of us who are clinically oriented see, which is a lack of getting to wound care kind of early enough or having wound care be involved in a sustained way. And part of this problem is that you're operating literally and figuratively in a very distinctly different setting than potentially the people who might refer you these patients or the settings in which the patient finds themselves like the emergency room, the inpatient setting, or even a primary care office. How much of this is really the lack of going, without confusing it with the name of the second proposal, upstream? So getting to the patient earlier versus some of what you described where you're trying to, it sounded like you're actually trying to calculate a 20% savings to the Medicare program. But I think what's hard for me personally is that it, it's, it doesn't feel like it feels like just adding dollars by having a per visit fixed dollar amount doesn't actually solve the problem you are trying to address. Um, so, so, to, so there are two parts. One is there is a financial problem because as I uh, explained in the proposal, uh, if somebody goes to hospital, uh, so if somebody comes with a lower extremity or a leg ulcer due to venous disease or even due to trauma, they develop swelling, and the swelling prevents uh, the wound from healing. If they go to ER, they do a nice job trying to stitch it up everything, but then the leg swells up as an inflammatory response or whatever reason, and it just opens up. So you, So we need to do a compression. Now, here's a problem. If I see the person, I do the dressing, under the Medicare current guidelines, I can uh, uh, debris the wound or do the treatment, but they will not pay for me for the compression. If I put the compression on, I can only charge for the compression. I cannot charge for anything else. I can charge for only thing, one thing at a time, which means basically I'm trying to do good quality care, so I'm basically eating up the cost. So that's one. Um, and then there is definitely prevention. Um, as the, the PTAC members did a, a review on literature uh, search themselves, one of the articles does talk about lack of education um, and lack of training or awareness. Um, some of the wounds we see in every wound clinic are due to uh, lack of awareness. Um, in, in, in metropolitan area like Boston, it's, there are many wound clinics, there are many specialists, but this becomes more important in smaller towns and rural or semi-rural areas where um, it's, it's, it's convenient for patients to go to, their, uh, to the physician and some incentive for the physician to be able to provide the services. Otherwise, um, people will just send them somewhere else. I'm not sure if it answers your question. No, that's fine. Thank you. Jen? Dr. Fruki, Dr. Weiler, one of, I have two questions for you. The first is one of the criteria we will be asked to look at is a scope. Uh, so it's unclear to me after reading the proposal, uh, how many providers and what type of providers would be eligible in this uh, payment model? I saw specifically you described outpatient wound care clinic providers with a recommendation of two years of experience. Um, but could you clarify uh, who would be eligible? Um, yes. So as I was doing my um, research before writing the proposal, there are uh, a whole number of uh, family practice and um, some uh, internal medicine physicians who do provide wound care in their office setting um, for various reasons. One, if there is no hospital-based wound clinic in the area, they have to do it, uh, or the hospital is not interested in opening a wound clinic, they have to do it, or uh, simply the patients prefer to go to their primary care physician. So uh, it, it will be an incentive, and those people would be included um, in, in, in this proposal. 
Um, and then I have a full-fledged freestanding wound clinic if somebody is interested in uh, narrowing down and just do the wound care to meet the needs of, uh, uh, of their communities, uh, those will be uh, included. Thank you. My next question is, as I read your proposal, there's no, uh, you, you described the importance of uh, providing high quality care to these patients, uh, but in the model proposal, there's no uh, description of risk to the provider based on the quality measures that you uh, have described. Is that correct? Um, that is, yes, that is correct. Um, well, so I am trying to compare it with the current system um, in which uh, I think one of the, the uh, um, weaknesses of the program is somebody goes to the hospital then and then comes back, then the program just picks it up again, and there is no uh, negative consequences. Um, it's, it's, in terms of risk, if, if the plan takes full consequence of everything, including a hospital admission, then the cost will simply not be worth it to do this uh, proposal. Um, and then my comparison is with the current system in which when people are going to, say, a hospital-based wound clinic and, and appropriate care is not provided, they end up in the hospital, they go back, uh, once they're discharged and restart where they left off. So, um, again, here at least there is uh, a limit, upper limit to how much that can be paid, and there will be um, the number of visits will, you know, after a certain point should or will trigger uh, why the person keeps going there, versus the current system where there is no limit, upper limit to how much is paid and upper limit to how many visits. Thank you. Tim. Uh, good morning. Um, thanks for, for doing the work on submitting this proposal. Um, this is going to be a slightly long question, but I think it builds off of what um, Kavita um, was asking, but maybe using some different terms. So the way I read your proposal, I see this as primarily a proposal to try to improve access to services. Um, on this committee, we have to consider at least three things conceptually, access, quality, and cost. And I think what you're hearing is questions related to the other two um, elements of that triad, quality and cost, and trying to figure out how this improved access to care for patients who could benefit from it um, uh, squares with uh, the quality and cost problem. And I'm going to, the, the specific question I have is related to incentives for referral. So wound care is a classic situation where the vast majority of patients can be handled by uh, a simple set of um, interventions. But in fact, some patients need extreme interventions, including, for example, lower extremity revascularization. That is not uncommon in the context of wound healing in the lower extremities. Um, and that's a very expensive, very high-end um, uh, procedure. So you have, you have a whole set a, a, across a continuum, and what your proposal is addressing is a very specific set on the lower end of that, decreasing costs and, and, um, and uh, improving access at the lower end. But I'm still concerned uh, along the line that Kavita was at, asking about barriers to referral when it's appropriate to refer. And, and specifically, if, if one were to create a bundled payment where everyone on the care team was, part, was contracted as part of that bundle, then there would be no financial disincentives for referral. But I, the way this, this, your proposal isolates a certain fraction of those patients without any a priori knowledge of whether or not they would end up needing a big procedure. Um, does, does your proposal then, um, how, how, is, how does your proposal either enhance or is impeded by the financial framework 
for referral to um, doctors who take care of more severe um, ulcers? Um, <clears throat> part of the reason to keep it simple is um, participation and not to uh, overload people or burden people with too much uh, uh, work. That's one thing. Second, uh, the example you cited, some people do need extensive procedures because wound is a mere uh, symptom or presentation of the underlying disorder. For example, neuropathy with diabetes, um, arterial disease, or some other issue going on. So once the person comes in, they do have to be referred to the specialist, as you cited, either to have a vascular intervention, whether venous or arterial, um, have to be seen by endocrinologist or primary care, or the, the wound physician has to work with them to control their blood sugar, because it's been cited in the literature, blood sugar greater than 200 um, slows or prevents the wound from healing, um, and similar issues. So I personally, and then if I keep the person who has an arterial disease for the sake of bringing him in um, for getting $400 every visit, this plus much more could be lost once the person um, has to lose the uh, 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 the foot or the leg and takes me to the court. So, um, and then, so there is clinical practice that when we see, uh, which happens everywhere, when you see a problem that needs an specialist attention, you simply send them there. So, um, to the specialist, like a vascular surgeon or somebody else. I don't see why this could be a hindrance to sending the people to the specialist for a specialist um, um, help. Um, the cost of seeing the specialist, again, it will con if, if we have a proposal which takes on everything, then the cost and the work with the spiral so much out of control um, that it will not be, uh, it, uh, we will not simply be able to implement um, uh, anything. So that's the reason for keeping it simple. Um, but I do not see why patients uh, could not be referred to specialists when they need a specialist services. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Faruqi from the committee? Seeing none. Um, the next part of our process is to get public comments. We have three folks who are registered. Um, Dr. Christopher Pittman is a board member of the American Vein and Lymphatic Society. He's on the phone. I'll turn it over to him. What? Um, and good morning, everyone. I'm just walking out of a patient room. This is Dr. Chris Pittman from Tampa, Florida. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Awesome. I'm an interventional radiologist by training. I practice in my own office-based clinic, and I'm devoted 100% to venous and lymphatic medicine. I'm board certified in both diagnostic radiology and interventional radiology, and I'm a diplomat at the American Board of Venous and Lymphatic Medicine. I'm also a board member and chair of the Healthcare Advocacy Committee of the American Vein and Lymphatic Society. The AVLS is approximately 2,000-member professional society dedicated to advocacy, research, and education in vein and lymphatic medicine. I have no relevant conflict of interest. However, I wish to declare that I am on the Scientific Advisory Board of Tactile Medical, a company that develops at-home therapy devices that treat lymphedema and chronic venous insufficiency. I echo the issues raised by the preliminary review team but I want to commend the applicant for initiating a very important discussion about wound care. I am sharing just two key points to underscore how important venous disease is in the clinical care of most wound patients. Key point number one, venous leg ulcers are statistically the leading cause of a non-healing wound. 
Chronic venous disease impacts up to 40% of the population and up to 4% of patients 65 and over will suffer from venous leg ulceration. Venous ulcers alone consume nearly 2% of the total healthcare budget in developed countries. Venous leg ulcers in the United States are a $15 billion a year public and private payer burden. To put this in perspective, diabetic foot ulcers are only approximately 10 billion a year burden because the prevalence of venous disease is much higher than diabetes. Venous leg ulcer patients make up the majority of patients in wound care centers. However, the recurrence rate of venous leg ulcers without venous intervention is shown to approximate 30% per year even under the best medical management. Leg ulcer patients in wound care centers are often not properly screened for venous disease, even though venous disease is statistically the leading cause of leg ulcers. Key point number two, and I'll wrap up. A landmark New England Journal of Medicine study entitled, A Randomized Trial of Early Endovenous Ablation and Venous Ulceration, published May 2018, concluded what every experienced vein care physician has understood for more than a decade, and I quote, venous disease is the most common cause of leg ulceration. Although compression therapy improves venous ulcer healing, it does not treat the underlying, underlying causes of venous hypertension. Pathways of care for leg ulcers in general do not include a provision for early assessment and treatment of superficial venous reflux. The lack of standardized models of care for leg ulcers and the involvement of a range of specialists may contribute to the inconsistent care delivered. The one-line conclusion from the study reads, and I quote, early endovenous ablation of superficial venous reflux resulted in faster healing of venous leg ulcers and more time free from ulcers than deferred endovenous ablation. Forgive the analogy, but when a vein physician eliminates a leak in the venous plumbing, the hole in the skin drywall will heal. For venous leg ulcer patients who are properly referred for vein care, leg wounds heal in weeks instead of months or years. I'd also like to highlight that these venous procedures are outpatient office-based procedures. On behalf of the American Vein and Lymphatic Society, I thank the PTAC for the opportunity to comment, and our society is pleased to be of assistance to the applicant or the PTAC for further detailed discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Pittman. Appreciate your comments. Dr. Helen Gelly. Hyperbar hyperbarics. Um, she's here in person. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank the members of the PTAC uh, for examining this issue and for allowing me to comment. As a bit of background, I have been practicing wound care and hyperbaric oxygen therapy in the office setting since 1993. Uh, I'm one of the founding uh, fellows of the American College of Wound Care Specialists. So I've been doing this for a very long time. A review of the quantitative analysis shows that the patients seen for wound uh, diagnoses are more than twice as likely to have diabetes, heart failure, peripheral vascular disease, and in fact, all comorbidities are more common. This identical patient profile exists in my aggregate re report. So when you look at my HCC score, which is about 2.8, it puts me in a category where I'm treating patients that are significantly more um, complicated and complex than anyone except someone doing critical care and nephrology and infectious disease. So it puts me at least in the top 10. Um, podiatry being seen as the primary uh, deliverer of uh, office-based wound care actually only limits these wounds to below the knee and in some states below the ankle. So I think that although this is uh, probably true looking at the numbers, um, the body doesn't end at the knee and so wounds are present everywhere. Uh, wound care has evolved since 1993 when wet to dry dressings uh, were the standard of care. Currently, maintaining a moist wound environment has become more costly as dressings and new products 
have been designed to create that environment. However, uh, practice expenses as calculated by the AMA RUC have not kept up. One question was, that was raised was whether or not we cherry pick patients. Well, I can tell you that in a private practice, if I say no once, that, patient, that referring physician will never call again. And I think that that's validated by my HCC score. Uh, with my limited time, I would like to offer uh, some recommendations because I think that this is worthy of further discussion. Uh, as presented in this uh, bundled model, it's not fully explored to take into consideration all of the aspects that need to be integrated. For example, I would recommend removing the NCC edits that CMS has in place, as Dr. Faruqi mentioned, if I do a debridement, I cannot put on a compression dressing. However, compression is the standard of care. So CMS is putting me in a quandary. Do I do one, do I do another, or do I ask the patient to come back for a second visit on the next day, which would be inappropriate on multiple levels. They should also allow physicians to charge DME rates for the products that are used to maximize the moist wound envi environment thus reducing the need for daily dressing changes. Uh, in this proposal, he's included uh, CTPs. In my opinion, those would need to be separate because CTPs are not appropriate for every wound care patient and should be applied towards the end of the uh, wound care encounter uh, and variably cannot be factored in over a 12 or a 16 uh, week period of time. That also brings up uh, his reference to the U.S. Wound Registry. There, the average patient stays in service seven months. And since the U.S. Wound Registry looks at predominantly hospital-based outpatient departments, although we also participate in that wound registry, seven months is really what we're looking at, not 14 weeks or four months. So this makes it very challenging to identify how we should make an average patient be put in one category of the length of time in service. Uh, the other question of referral bias, which was brought up, uh, would be addressed by um, using quality measures, which physicians do do reporting for. And within the US Wound Registry, quality measures include appropriate referral for compression at every uh, visit for a wound care patient that has venous stasis disease. It also um, includes uh, vascular assessment and potential interventions for patients who have lower extremity ulcers, including venous ulcers and diabetic foot ulcers, and the list goes on. So there are quality measures that can be utilized which currently exist and are approved by CMS to uh, be able to factor in whether physicians are appropriately uh, utilizing the referrals that are necessary to get the patients um, healed. And then the other question, or excuse me, the other point I'd like to bring up is that the current ICD-10 codes are not helpful in identifying multiple wounds in one patient in the same anatomic area. And this is not uncommon in the area of venous ulcers where there might be multiple areas uh, where one may be treated uh, for a certain period of time, but then it kind of gets confused as to if someone then has a traumatic ulcer or traumatic wound on the same extremity, you cannot really differentiate that. And that's a coding problem that um, I don't think that we can resolve here. Uh, but it will be increasingly important uh, in chronic elder care that we address this issue because it's not just a matter of increased cost, it also is a matter of increased availability. And what we haven't addressed here because we're talking about traditional Medicare is that many of our patients are now in Medicare Advantage plans and the actual cost to the patient uh, is increasing because they have out-of-pocket costs of six to $7,000 which can easily be eaten up by a number of uh, hospital outpatient department 
visits. So I would like to thank uh, PTAC for looking at this um, as an, um, a topic of interest. And um, if anyone has any questions, I would love to be a resource for you all uh, in your plans to uh, expand or look at this uh, in other uh, applications. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gelly. Um, Louis Savant, Director for Cyrus Therapeutics. Thank you. All right, thank you, and thank you. To, thank you. I'd like to thank the committee for uh, allowing public comments and to, as, as Helen said, to address this issue of wound care is really important. Uh, we just have a few comments. Uh, number one is we, uh, we, we concur with most of the comments that the, that the committee had regarding the proposal. Um, the, the main comment that we would like to make is just to emphasize uh, what's already been said and that, that wound care is a, uh, a very complex uh, specialty um, and it's not treated as a specialty very often. You know, we have cancer specialists, we have uh, rheumatology, we, you know, there's specialties for everything, but wound care is one of those specialties where um, we don't have a true specialist. And because of that, uh, the, you know, wound care itself often doesn't get treated like a specialty. Uh, so we would encourage the, the committee and CMS to continue to uh, explore wound care and, uh, and, and continue to, to look at this very closely. Um, the, the final comments uh, is just that uh, what Dr. Faruqi is saying uh, regarding uh, standard of care. Standard of care uh, continues to evolve and change, and, um, and the, the payment methodologies uh, often restrict doctors from what they can do. Um, as a, our company, Osiris, we've been around for, for 26 years uh, researching cellular tissue-based products. That's what, that's what our company does. And so we offer one of those advanced therapies. And in the course of our research, uh, it's become obvious that uh, it's an adjunct to, therapy, to good standard of care. Um, and when wound care specialists are restricted due to payment uh, or uh, you know, guidelines restricting the, the treatments, uh, it certainly impacts uh, you know, the, what our product is capable of doing. So, Removing the, the edits and, uh, and looking at new ways of, um, of paying for therapies uh, together, multimodal therapies. Most of the time, uh, a physician is restricted. You can only do one treatment at a time. So if you put a, um, a cellular tissue product on a patient that has already failed a um, standard of care, um, but they don't get paid for compression, or they can't do negative pressure, um, or they can't do these other therapies uh, together, uh, you're really um, hamstringing a wound care specialist. And you know, again, the final comment would be that other, other specialties like cancer, you wouldn't say to a cancer specialist, you can only do this one treatment um, and not do this other treatment if the evidence shows that the treatments together might, be work, might work better in concert. So that's our final comments. Thank you. Thank you. We have one additional uh, individual, uh, Dr. Brian Lejinquist, managing partner for Surgical, Surgical Wound Care Associates. He's here on site. Yep. Thank you. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Um, Dr. Faruqi, thank you for your work on this. It's important. Um, echo the comments that we've heard. Um, that <clears throat> we're, we're talking about access. Dr. Terrell, you, did I say that right? Terrell, yeah. You talk about going to nursing homes to do wound treatments, right? That's the access, we do that. We get in our cars, we drive there. That's the early access. Um, we have a hard time at Surgical Wound Care Associates finding more doctors to staff our clinics that's growing. <clears throat> Excuse me. What worries me is that we have this evolving specialty that's not even a specialty yet, but it's very complex like we've talked about. It worries me that we're being premature and putting limits on it. Um, it it's too early for that. Um, we find we have an average heal time of 5.2 weeks using the advanced graphs and, and these high-end procedures with the interventionalists. Uh, Dr. Pittman, I love, 
love your excitement if you're still on the phone. That's what we live every day. To see these patients come in with wounds that have affected their lives. Um, they can't have a social life. Their kids, their grandkids won't come around them because they're smelly and leaky. And get, uh, physicians like Dr. Pittman, products that we see here, putting those together and getting that full closure with a pristine native tissue in six weeks is so cool, so rewarding. And so um, as we talk about how to contain costs, it has to be part of the conversation, but we're just not there yet. We're still exploring you know, what are best practices. Um, interventional radiology has been such a powerful tool that we use 85% of our patients get a referral for either vascular or arterial or both, and 65% and of those receive an intervention. That happens in the first week. When we see that patient for an initial visit, they come back revascularized from this percutaneous procedure, and then we can get to work. Um, I always say we can't grow a garden without water, and we heard the drywall. I mean, it's, it's the same thing. We have, to, we have to treat the complexities of these very sick patients. Um, it concerns me that we're putting limits on wound care prematurely right now. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Oh, one more? Is there one more? Yep. Maybe two. I mean, like I said, maybe two more. Okay, well, all right. Yeah, okay. I, I registered on, online. I guess there may be a mix-up. So my name is uh, Bill Tuttlebach. I appreciate giving me the time to speak. My background actually is infectious diseases as well as hyperbaric, you know, understanding hyperbaric medicine and, uh, and obviously wound care. And I currently am the associate CMO for MyMedics and I'm also actively practicing as medical director for Landmark Hospitals. I also, uh, until recently, was the executive system medical director for Intermountain Healthcare. I oversaw wound care for 22 hospitals, 10 outpatient clinics. Uh, for the last five years, I was treating uh, faculty for the podiatry re residency. I also uh, was involved in uh, bringing up systems for the Methodist Lip Honor System in Memphis. So this is, you know, obviously a passion. Everyone that's got up here has been a, is passionate about this. And so I agree with everything that has been said from the mic today. I thank Dr. Gelly, Helen Gelly, for her comments. The, the problem is looking at this on a broad uh, perspective, I agree, access is the issue here, increasing access. And having uh, worked where we've had to increase access within a hospital-affiliated system from just two clinics to 10 clinics over five years, uh, we still didn't scratch the surface. Uh, we worked very closely with the uh, non-affiliated clinics, you know, the referral systems, and I've also been heavily involved in research. And so the last three, three years, we've done uh, venous leg ulcer studies, uh, diabetic foot ulcer studies, and just looking at the standard of care, these are large randomized controlled trials, put them all together, it's over 300 patients. The typical with standard of care, meaning just like an alginate, you know, compression for venous leg ulcers, offloading, you get up to 50% healing rates. That's a good number, but the other 50% do not heal with standard of care. And so this model, this proposal, will, as mentioned before, will eliminate some of these advanced therapies that can be done in the non-affiliated outpatient setting uh, by eliminating some of these Q codes and putting it into just a bundled payment. The other thing is just even putting on a cast for offloading uh, reaches the ceiling and actually makes it a, a loss for seeing these patients when you can't charge for the cost of the cast, it's bundled into the payment. So there's a very limited range of treatment that's gonna be uh, allowable within this. And so this is gonna get into this uh, system or what we say in the medical field, especially in epidemiology for infectious diseases, this is gonna be like squeezing the, the balloon. So you're gonna be squeezing the cost down in one area, and it's just gonna blossom in another area where there's gonna be more patients or referrals going into hospital-affiliated clinics, which is, if I was still there, it'd be great, but to tell you the truth, we couldn't handle the volume. We would have to build more uh, clinics, and it stresses that multi-specialty. This is a multi-specialty, so this will also, there's a trend for wound care in the outpatient setting to move back out into the outpatient setting. There are these multi-specialty clinics now where you have angio suites, MRIs, hyperbaric, and the wound centers all in one. This is actually what we want, and this is gonna maybe inhibit this. Traditional wound care with just someone 
treating the wound is really, I think, five, 10 years now is gonna be the old standard of doing things, and this bundled payment will, will halt that. So that's you know, really my input, having a broad you know, perspective with evidence, showing that you, we still have 50% of these you know, DFUs and VLUs, which is the major portion of these. I have to tell you, I've also uh, had the opportunity to, over the last year to work with folks in the NHS uh, which they struggle with the same problem. They have a capitated system, and a lot of the rural or community-based medicine has been a complete failure with these bundled uh, type or limitations on what can be done by who is treating them, which is, in, in essence, reducing the cost. Uh, so we should not fall into that same trap. We need a different payment model, as we talked to here, expanded maybe for you know putting on compression, keeping advanced therapies available, and uh, at the same time, I think you're gonna have folks holding onto these patients for extended period of times because this turns into a lucrative model. You know, it's gonna take you know seven months you hear, but really these folks can be 12 to two years if you look at the NHS data. I mean, 12 months to, to 24 months, and now you're talking 20, 40 thousand dollars for one patient for you know for uh, you know closure, which is far less than allowing advanced therapies and sort of individual. Uh, uh, therapeutics to be charged within that in that patient visit. So that's I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and since I don't have you registered, I can't introduce you. You have to introduce yourself. And I'm happy to do so. Uh, good morning. My name is Marcia, Marcia Nuskart. I'm the executive director of the Alliance of Wound Care Stakeholders. And you heard from Dr. Gella, you heard from Dr. Pittman. Uh, they also represent, they're some of our members. Um, the, uh, the Alliance is a nonprofit multidisciplinary trade association of physician specialty societies, clinical and patient organizations, whose mission is to be able to promote evidence-based quality care and access to products and services for people with chronic wounds through effective advocacy and educational research. So our focus is on wound care research, developing of quality measures for wound care, as well as reimbursement. And we're happy to be able to work with you if you decide that, uh, as Dr. Behrensen would probably say, there needs to be some changes in terms of prevention, it changes in the uh, coverage with the LCDs as well as payment. Happy to be a resource to you as well as uh, education more in the wound care space. So as some of the other um, presenters had mentioned, that we appreciate this uh, CI Medical had brought up the subject you know, of chronic wound care to the PTAC's attention. Since um, it was noted, our value in health study, that 15% of the Medicare population has a chronic wound, and the total Medicare uh, spending on wound care types could be anywhere from 28 to uh, 96 billion, depending upon whether wound care is a primary or secondary diagnosis. I have to tell you, I was so impressed with what I had read from the PTAC um, preliminary review team because it did an outstanding job of addressing some of the issues within this particular proposal. So we're in agreement with the preliminary results with the proposal as written that it has a number of structural flaws in it and therefore the and elements that weren't sufficiently developed. Uh, for instance, as stated in criteria number three of the payment methodology, we have concerns that that proposed $400 per visit, all-inclusive payment, will not allow the providers to probably give the high-quality wound care services, patients with diabetic foot ulcers, venous stasis ulcer, and pressure ulcers. You already know, you tra treated these patients. They are sick, complex patients uh, and could be very complicated and have complex medical needs. We agree with the assessment and criteria number nine on patient safety. This low payment could result in risks relating to stinting on care. Also, the proposal didn't require the provider to adhere to a particular care model, follow a particular set of national guidelines or establish protocols in order to achieve the desired cost and utilization objectives. It's also lacking on how the proposed quality metrics would be measured. We're concerned that the patients just may not be well served under this simplified model. Wound care is really a symptom of a, a disease, and these patients, as Dr. Gelly and others mentioned, have a tremendous number of comorbidities that need to be treated, 
In fact, some of the most pre prevalent comorbid diseases are hypertension, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, heart failure, ischemic heart disease, uh, osteoarthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis. Noting the seriousness, seriousness of treating these comorbid conditions, we're in agreement with the PDAC's concern that this proposal doesn't include a severity or complexity component to account for the comorbidities and other factors. We're also in agreement, you already mentioned, wound care is multidisciplinary. There needs to be able to be an adequate team of physicians, uh, whether they're surgeons, vascular medicine physicians, podiatrists, dermatologists, nurse practitioners, infectious disease experts, physical therapists, nurses, registered dietitian, dietitian nutritionists, lymphedema therapists, and primary care physicians to be able to treat for these patients. We're in agreement with that PRT's environmental scan underscoring that the multidisciplinary approach to treating a patient is the most important element to the success of treatment because no single healthcare provider is adequately equipped with the skills, knowledge, and experience to provide the comprehensive care for all the chronic wound care types. And you'd want to make sure that the PTAC, um, that this proposal allows for this type of expertise. It's very interesting, and I was, uh, I had mentioned to a number of people in the audience that creating a bundled payment for any type of chronic condition, especially one that involves chronic wound care, it's very complex with many details, and thus very difficult to not only create, but also implement. We just met uh, with the CMS's uh, hospital outpatient you know, department because they're looking to be able to figure out payment for only a small portion in the wound care space. That's actually the application and the products of those quote unquote skin substitutes. Um, the more uh, clinically appropriate term is, is what Dr. Kelly, uh, Gelly mentioned, cellular and or tissue based products for skin wounds, otherwise known as CTPs. But we, it was very interesting because when we were talking with, the, with them, they had mentioned um, the fact that they need to be very thoughtful about all of this. They were trying to figure out whether there's something that CMMI might want to be able to do. We had thought that CMI has probably bigger fish to fry. Perhaps if there was something that was for diabetes, then you could probably have some type of episode for the diabetic foot ulcers. But um, again, wound care being very complex and uh, the fact that what we had mentioned is there need to be taken into account not only the NCCI edits, but also the patient comorbidities. So we are in agreement with the PTAC's preliminary recommendations. Don't believe the proposal should move forward as is currently written, but because of the 20 different clinical associations that we have as our members, that we'd be pleased to be able to work with you to figure out if you want to move forward with something like this, please use this as a resource. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I just need to check to make sure there's no other uh, unregistered registered folks. We're good? Okay, very good. Oh, well, I want to again thank Dr. Faroki for submitting the proposal, working with the PRT team to get us to where we are today. The public commenters and the folks on the phone appreciate that input. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at taxpayer expense.